Hi, welcome to Think Tech. We are raising public awareness about energy, technology, globalism, and diversification. This show is Center Stage, and I am your host, Donna Blanchard, very proud managing director of Kumukuhua Theater. We are coming to you live from Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu, very near Kumukuhua Theater. If you would like to see this show at a later time or check out any of our shows, you can find them archived on thinktechhawaii.com. You can also go to YouTube and find us there. If you would ever like to join us in our downtown studio, please email j at thinktechhawaii.com. My guest today is Tom Mandro. He is an artist. I went to his gallery in Haleiwa and immediately fell in love with his work. And as luck had it, he turned the corner. I got to meet him, and I said, you must do my show. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Tom Mandro. Welcome, and well, thank, thank you, you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I know you've been traveling a lot. It took a little while to get you scheduled in, but I'm really, really happy that you are here. I do have a travel schedule. You do have quite a bit of travel schedule, and let's talk about that, because you have galleries in, in Haleiwa? Holly, I have two locations in Haleiwa. I have a gallery in Las Vegas and my working studio in Vegas, and I also have a gallery at Sun Moon Lake in Taiwan. So that kind of adds to the miles, too. <laughs> yeah, and you're opening a new one. Then. Yeah, we'll be opening up a second gallery after the first of the year in Taipei, oh. so right in the main city. You, uh, is the studio where you do most of your work in Vegas? In Vegas, yeah. I do paint when I'm in Hawaii. In fact, I paint everywhere I am. But my real working studio is, I have a 6,000-square-foot studio there that I've been in for 20 years. So to say the least, it may be the biggest mess in the world, but it's my mess, and it's where I get all my stuff done. Oh, okay, okay. So and in addition to um, all of those studios that you have in the new one opening, you do shows. I do shows. Um, not like I used to. I used to do a whole lot more. I've, I've, I've tried to simplify my life somewhat, <laughs> yet it never seems to be that simple. Because I was represented in a coalition of galleries all over the country and in Japan at one point. And then I finally um, consolidated down to only galleries I own and special events. In fact, like last weekend, for example, I did a special event in Las Vegas um, at the Arts Factory, which is a place right in the middle of the Arts District in Las Vegas. And it was a charity event to raise money for uh, We Care, which is a women's rehabilitation house. That's, it's kind of funny. It's the oldest uh, rehabilitation house in Las Vegas, and nobody knows about it. And it's only for women, and they've helped thousands of women through the years. But it was a great fundraiser. It really came off wonderful. They raised a lot of money. Oh, oh that's awesome. So it was good. So you only show in your galleries and things that yeah. are touch your heart. Yeah, and, and who knows, that may change again. Like I said, every five to ten years, it seems my, like my career, I start making changes again on how I'm going to be represented. And, but, you know, all together, I, I, this is the 40th anniversary of my first one-man show, so I have been getting away with it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back now, because you have a very interesting story. At, you, you created your first painting at 18. Oh, months. that's the first one that's framed and I have. I mean, I have that painting. It hangs in my studio right in the first reception room. And it's actually, uh, you know, it's a very interesting piece. I, in fact, the reason it's hanging there is so that I can see it every day when I come to work. And I do consider my studio going to work. Um, I, I tell people, one of the reasons I've been reasonably successful at this is because it's my job. And I look at it as such. In other words, I don't paint at home. I don't, you know, I get up like every other working stiff and I go to work in the morning. Okay. And I, but I work seven days a week. Do you keep, do you keep yourself on a schedule with that thing? Uh, not really. I mean, there's, you know, there's regular life stuff too. Yeah, but I, I just put in a big day every day. Yeah. Um, I, I was telling somebody earlier, I said, yeah, the way I start my day is I wake up and go, oh, you're still here. Okay, I guess you got to do something today. And <laughs> then I start. Yeah, <laughs> go from there. But do, I'm very curious about this because artists, uh, I've talked with, um, I've talked with artists, playwrights, as well as uh, uh, painters of all different ilk who say, I sit down at my computer or I go to my easel at such and such a time every day. Oh, this no. is what I do. No, no every, every day is okay. a little different because, you know, everybody, I think most people's lives 
play out differently every day. You have different responsibilities, different things happening, you know, stuff you don't plan on mm -hmm. that come up you have to take care of. So to have a really rigid schedule would never work for me. Like I said, I, I, I do everything I can in every day. I, in fact, I'm, I've, I don't know where this came from, but when I was, I remember as far back as I can, I have always felt that I'm against the clock. It's not being old like I am now and thinking about like I don't have time left. I have felt this way since I'm a little kid. I've always had, I know most kids, you know, you have a sense of almost immortality. I somehow always felt my mortality, oh. that I have limited time, you know. And I still believe that because, you know, even if you live to be 120 and you're in perfect health the whole time, how much time is that? It's still limited. Exactly. It's pretty small. <laughs> well, that's an awful lot of weight to carry oh, around. Oh, no, not at all. Is it? No? No. In fact, it makes every day that much more rewarding because I get to accomplish a lot. Uh, okay, but don't you find, we're, boy, we're getting right into it right away here. <laughs> don't you find that when you are in the middle, of, maybe you're in the middle of painting something that you love, do you lose time? Oh, I, yeah, there, I'm, there are times in the studio that, you know, I'll, I'll start on something at, you know, 7 in the morning. Next thing I know, it's 2 in the morning because I got so involved in a painting. That doesn't happen quite as often as it used to because I have so many projects going on. And what I like to do is I bounce among my studio. I'm very fortunate. Like I said, I have a very large studio. Um, it's a very unique studio in that just the size of it allows me to have a zillion projects going at once mm. and if I get stuck on one you know like I, I'm at a place or even if paint has to dry before I do the next step man I can move on to another project or another one or another one or another one you know there's always so much to do how many do you think you have going right oh, now in your studio? at any given time I have between 20 and 30 projects they're not all paintings because I sculpt but, and I work in, even my paintings, I am presently doing three collections. Typically, I'm usually in a two, I've always painted in collections. And eventually, that collection, I guess it um, runs its course with me, and I'm on to something else, because it has led me in a new direction by the time it's over. Um, and so typically, I have my collection that's, that's what I'm kind of known for, and then some other experimental collection will start taking form, and, uh, and so I'll have two. But right now, I'm painting in three because my oldest collection, I've actually been in this one for over 20 years, which is really unusual. I usually drop one by that time. Mm. Uh, but this one, it, it's still got my interest. As long as it's, I'm not one of the artists, and God bless them, the ones who do this, and it's just not me, where they do one specific thing pretty much their whole career. I have never ever done that. I've constantly, it's not that I'm even trying to evolve, it's just the whole process of art in general intrigues me. It's always been in my head and I'm always got ideas about, hmm, I wonder if I try that. In fact, I'm the guy, you've probably known him, that no matter what he buys, when he reads the directions and it says don't do this, that'll be the first thing I do. That's what just to see try. what happens. Yeah. <laughs> So let's say, and which, we're going to look at some of your paintings a little okay. bit later. Um, wh uh, which collection is it that you've been in for 20 it's years? It's called Vibrant Expressions. Okay. It, in fact, it, it really kind of saved my career. Um, I was classically trained from the time I was six years old as a realist. I was trained in oil, which I don't use anymore. Um, and, you know, through the years and through school and everything else, I finally got to where I was becoming a photorealist which, you know, there's, there's a real wow factor to that. You know, when somebody looks at a photorealistic painting, they always go, oh, my God, that's a painting? I thought it was a photograph. Well, the wow factor, see, that's not really ever gotten me too much. And I've always made, I'm, when I got that far, I maintained that I can teach you to be a photorealist. As long as you have patience and you can copy which is patience, you know, look at a little part, copy it exactly. Mm. You can be a photorealist. But there was, it got to, there was no creativity at all because you're just copying a photo. Mm. And so it, it got to where, uh, and I have, I've, st I've done other things throughout my career every now and again. I'll just get too frustrated with what I'm doing. And that was one time I thought I was going to be done completely. 
But I started doing something, by, and it was kind of by mistake, uh, as most of the things that happened to me are. I've never really had a plan. Um, and I started painting backwards. And when I say painting backwards, I started doing everything opposite of everything I learned. Uh, break, break that down, because okay, if you for learned example, realism... In realism, the background is the least important part of the piece. In fact, if you look at Renaissance artists or anybody, you know, the skies are just kind of muddled, and, you know, the back part of the whatever they're painting, whether it's a city or whatever, you know, it's not really highly defined. It's the main character or the main theme of the art is the most important part, the backgrounds of no consequence. What I started doing, and especially because being a realist, there's nothing abstract about what you're doing. I started throwing paint, pouring paint, squeezing paint, putting additives in, as if I was doing a Jackson Pollock abstract. And I would do this on canvases, and then I'd leave the canvases all around my studio. And, you know, now this was after, like I said, it would be an abstract that I thought, if I was an abstract artist, which I was not, that I would be perfectly fine with this, because it would have good balance and the color worked right and everything else. Once I got the background to that abstract state where I think it could hang on its own, mm -hmm. I would lay them around my studio. And like I said, once again, having all this room helped. And every day I'd see these abstracts until I saw something in the background. So this abstract background really became the most important part of the painting because it suggested what the painting was going to be. Whether it's a tiger face or a honu or whatever, I could see, okay, you know what, this will fit right in here. There's a horse there. I can see a horse's head, I'll just paint it in. And, um, and the background would actually show through. It was almost like the background was the painting and I was just adding detail to bring it out. And so it was completely opposite of everything. In other words, there was no plan to begin with for the painting. The background becomes the most important part of the painting <laughs> instead of the least important. Everything was opposite. And it saved my career because it was just wildly inventive to me and, and, and my, my, my brain would go nuts. Yeah. And Plus I'd see all these things. In fact, I could tell you, it's, it's almost a, um, it's not really in bad taste, but it is kind of funny. There was a gallery that I was represented by, and I would bring these paintings in. Cause, and you know, the audience, which was amazing, the, really glommed on to them. You know, they, they started becoming very successful. Well, there was a new sales consultant came up to me, and just like me, in parts of the background, he saw stuff. And what he had seen was a nude in the background. And so he asked me, he says, did you paint a little nude in here? And I said to him, I said, they haven't told you yet? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, it's kind of, it's an inner circle kind of secret, but in every one of my paintings, <laughs> I put at least one female body part all the way up to a full nude. And I walked away, I didn't think anything, I thought it was kind of funny. Well, God, for the next couple months, every time a new painting would go on the wall and he would see me, he'd kind of walk by me, very, you know, like, like he knows the secret, and he'd walk by and go, <laughs> I found it. <laughs> but it was kind of cool because a lot of people, when you have an app, will see things in it, and mm. not necessarily what I saw. But that whole thing, you know, it, it was a whole different kind of art that people, or the observer, so to speak, could see what they want to see on top of what I painted in it. Yeah. And so it, it, and that's probably why I'm still in it, because you know what? Every one of those backgrounds gives me something different to paint. Very cool. And it keep, I think it keeps my, it's a, it's a mind exercise, too. I think it keeps my atrophying brain at least a bit active because, you know, I have to see something in the background or I don't paint you it. You have to let it happen. Yeah. Okay, so let's back up. You, um, you started working in art very, very young. Very Your parents young. encouraged you, but neither of them were artists? Well, my mom was an incredibly gifted drawer. In fact, she had gone to art school when she was a, a younger girl, but, you know, between the Depression and World War II and everything else, you know, she just didn't have the time or the, um, what would you call it, the financial resources to, to pursue it. She had been in art school for a while. Um, but she, you know, it's funny because she was kind of an early influence. I, I still remember sitting with her as she would draw, like I remember one is real specific. We had this big Civil War book with all these old Civil War photographs, and there was one of Abraham Lincoln sitting in a chair, and she drew that for me from the book, and I would watch her draw. 
So she was, um, I think maybe there was maybe some genetic there. My dad was a professional football coach and very good at what he did. Um, he coached for 38 years, which is kind of unheard of. And out of 38 years, only had two losing seasons. But once again, he, that's another inspiration in that he loved athletes. He loved what human beings could do, you know, and he loved the game of football. So he worked, God, I'd say 18 hours a day. You know, pro oh. football coaches are, cr are a crazy bunch. He never took days off. They work all year long. They still do. The winning coaches still are like that. They sleep in their offices. But I think between the two of them, watching my mom raise five kids and watching how hard my dad worked might be part of my work ethic also. Because, you know, as a kid, a lot of times you, you do what you see. Where are you in the birth order in your family? Number one out of five, Ooh. which means they didn't have a clue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they probably Thankfully, had more. Thankfully, I was I obviously really headstrong and, you know, j a different kind of kid, I think. They probably had more constraints on you than the others, did, I don't, don't you think? Uh, you know, I, I don't remember. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> In fact, that's okay. another reason that 18-month-old piece is up there, because sometimes I really do look at that and go, God, what was I thinking? Or I'm, you know, like, what process? I mean, I'm in diapers. I'm 18 yeah. months old. And this thing is really pretty incredible. I mean, you can, there's an elephant and a cowboy, and there's a butterfly and a dog, and they really are there. And they're, it's so funny because it's almost the same kind of color combinations I use now. Oh. And it's a triptych. So it was even complicated on that. It was three separate panels that all fit together. I, I wish we had an image of that. Yeah. We'll get to the images in a little while. Oh, we got to get to a break. Oh, okay. um, we're going to take just a little bit of break here. We'll be right back. This is Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is our flagship show, which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. And the, uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important, and there's so many developments happening across the state. And we hope you'll tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. It's wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon uh, that uh, we are talking about every Wednesday, 4 to 5, uh, we talk about some of the most important subjects that uh, are affecting the islands uh, now and into the future. Uh, energy, clean energy, we need it. Uh, we often run into uh, new ideas that we had not uh, thought about before. Uh, we did just today, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think we're going to have more of that uh, in the future. So. Uh, come on down and, uh, and watch us uh, 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, um, and we'll uh, see what happens. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. Hi, we're back. We're live. This is Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Series. I am Donna Blanchard, proud managing director of Kumukuhua Theater, and I'm talking with artist Tom Mandro, and we're going to get right back into it here. Um, how old were you when you felt like you had reached that crisis that you were just tired of photorealism and not sure what you were going to do? Oh, God, probably 20 some odd years ago. Um, I was probably late 30s, early 40s. Okay. And did you consider, so you were tired of doing what you were doing, did you consider doing something outside? I actually, for, for a while, and it was for a couple different reasons. Um, one was that, was that you know, I was, I was kind of done painting. And another was a whole different reason. I don't know if we'll go into it or not. But um, I actually went into the business of art, oh. which was pretty interesting because it became interesting. You know, um, I'd always had people that took care of any of that. In the old days, which is really different than now, um, if a gallery represented you, it was really kind of a handshake. And the other part was, is you didn't go into, like I told you, I was in coast-to-coast -coast galleries at one time. You know, I was in 26 galleries. In the old days, 70s, if a gallery represented you, you were kind of like in their stable. 
because they believed in your work. Whereas now it's all about galleries believing whether they can sell or not. Then it was they believed in the work. And of course, it still was bottom line. They still had to sell the work. But they believed in you enough and what you were doing that they'd even pay you a salary to keep you painting until they could develop collectors for you. And so, you know, it was a whole different world then. And so I wound up getting in, when I came to Hawaii, I wound up getting into the business of art. I still painted, but not like I did before. And I wound up having picture frame shops and pack and ship shops. I published artists. I did limited editions for them. I repped them. You know, I, I did this whole thing. Um, and in fact, for the most part, I didn't even really want people in Ma I lived in Maui, want people to know that I was actually an artist. I was just on the business side of it. And uh, so, you know, it's funny because I worked with Robert Nelson and Christian Lassen. In fact, pretty much every major Hawaii artist, I worked with them in some way or another. And it was kind of fun being kind of a different anonymous kind of person uh -huh. rather than being the artist in the mainland who, at least in my circle of art, because, you know, it's funny. Even the fame of being an artist is typically very regional. You know, I mean, yeah, you'll know about Tom Kincaid, but very few artists do $260 million a year, <laughs> you know, and, and so people know about that, or you might know that Yoko Ono was an artist. But other than that, the fame of artists, like here, Heather Brown, for example, you know, it's, she's regional, they love her in Japan, and she's doing very well. But it's not the kind of thing like myself or anybody if you went to somebody in Iowa and said, do you know this artist? They, they would, would not, chances are. So, but it's fun to watch, and, and I think I got caught up in it early on, where you think you're something that you're not. <laughs> you, know, you get caught up in, oh, I'm making money, and, I, and everybody knows who I am. Well, no, they don't, like this little circle and around you And then you, you go guys. outside. Yeah, of, exactly. Yeah. That happens with artists of all different. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, yeah. well, and like I said, as, as a younger person, you know, like you have a more of a tendency to have a more godlike feel to yourself. <laughs> and, you know, I, at least in my case, as I've gotten older, I really, I've worked on the humility part of everything because, you know, I think life is pretty much that. It's not about me. You've worked on that. That's an interesting oh, absolutely. thing to say. So um, you, how long did you work on the business side, and stay, were you still painting? Uh, yeah, then? I was still painting, but okay. um, in fact, it's kind of funny how I dove back into painting really full time. Is I got tired of employees. Oh, because you <laughs> it, were managing it, it, employees. I, my business got big. Okay. It really did. I I turned out to be decent at business. I still don't think I'm great at business. But I was really decent at it, and I had up to 73 employees working for me, both here in the mainland. And finally, one day, I was just, I was done. I was just, I don't even know what the, I can't remember what the straw was that broke the camel's back, so to speak. But I just was done. I wanted to paint full time again. Because what I, w I had started doing, I would take, say it was Christian Lassen, who was a good friend. He still is a good friend. And he was doing, obviously, very well. Well, I would do tricks because... I would paint a Christian Lassen painting. I mean, I painted oh, it, okay. but it would be exactly as if Christian painted it. Oh. And one time, I put one in the big frame shop because we did all the framing for all the Lassen galleries, and I put this painting over side, and his driver came in and saw it, and really, she freaked out because she couldn't remember having, she couldn't remember bringing it in. Where did that come from? I don't remember that original. And so she took a picture, and uh, you know Christian saw it, and he couldn't remember painting it, but he knew it was his. And so I what, thought was, to myself, was it a, a replica of something he had done, no, or was it, it just was his a, style? You no, know, it was his style, but to a T. Oh. And I did one in Nelson. I started doing this just to mess with him, and then I started realizing, you know what? I really miss painting full time. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the business part was probably driving me crazy, and other things had changed. And I thought, you know what? This is kind of weird to reconstruct, or try to reconstruct 100% a career now in my 40s. So how much time it elapsed? Eight, nine years. Oh. And, and this is the kind of business also, you know, it's a what have you done for me lately, or who have you sold to lately, who's your collectors, all this. Mm -hmm. And you know what, once again, I just, I, like my wife would say, Tom, you are surrounded by angels. She really <laughs> believes that. 
And, uh, yeah, I lucked out again. I mean, things went well, and I can't really complain about anything. So is this when you went to doing everything opposite? Well, I, I had already been experimenting with that. Okay. Yeah, I was already experimenting, but this is when I gave it my full-blown, let's do this. Okay. But and I wound up selling my businesses to another artist, a pretty major artist. Oh. Um, who wanted their own in-house framing, their own in-house publishing, everything else. So I sold the whole mess. And it's funny because I sold it for half of what it was worth. Uh, it's one of those things where literally when I make a decision like that, like, okay, I'm going to change my life. I don't really care about the rest of the stuff. I just want to do it. And so... Um, so your friend got a... Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, they, they had already had contacted me several years before about maybe purchasing the whole framing division and everything to do their own because they had a bunch of galleries. And when they when we got the um, appraisals and everything, they were just like, God, that's a lot of money. Uh -huh. And so it never went anywhere. And I was okay because I was still was having fun doing it. Well, when I decided I didn't want to do it anymore, I called the same person up. And just and he, he, he said to me, he goes, oh, we already went over that. You know, it's just, you're, by now it's probably even worth more. And I said, yeah, but here's a question. I said, what if I gave you one word that may change your mind? And he started laughing. He goes, what one word is that? I said, half. <laughs> he goes, half of what it's worth? I said, yeah. He goes, what are you doing tomorrow? I'll fly over. <laughs> and that's nice. how quick we finished and this And that deal. got you back into it. Well, let's yeah. take a look at some of your paintings. Okay. I want to make sure that we get to these. Um, and Zuri, just in the order they're on there, will be cool. Mm -hmm. We'll see them in just a oh. oh. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that's actually a transitional piece. It was obviously from a European trip. It was Café de Flore. And that, that's when you, it's very first of the change from realism. You know, it's still very representational, but I started doing it in pieces, you know, where I'd start painting chunks of it, and part of the background would show through. And um, it, that's a, what I would call a transitional piece because it's not really a vibrant expressions yet, mm -hmm. but it's not real, you know, photorealism. Yeah. It was, there, was, there was a period of about probably a couple of years that I was bouncing through because I was developing a style. And um, so that, you know, actually it's kind of funny. I know a collector in Minnesota owns that piece. Oh. And it's, what's really funny is I met them on a, when I was in Europe, traipsing around, and we just happened to sit at the same table at a cafe. And so they went to their web, went to a website when they got home, got in touch with me, and they bought that thing. Oh, and chose that one. Yeah, because it was one of so I, even weird stuff like that happens. That's pretty cool. You did something very, uh, the depth of that is interesting. But let's yeah. go on to the next one, because we've got a bunch. I don't want to go back. Ooh. Okay, you can see that whole top segment, the whole sky. Yeah. That's poured paint. I didn't paint that. I threw the paint, I poured it, I held the canvas up, I let it roll all over. And when it was done, it looked like a desert sunset. And like, you know, like there's certain of them that where the sky looks like it's on fire. I mean, here in Hawaii, we have beautiful sunsets. I live on the beach in Waialua, so I get really nice sunsets. But I will also say, in Las Vegas or Nevada or Arizona, oh, yeah, beautiful sunsets too. You know, yeah. so I live in two sunset places. <laughs> but that one, yeah, that, talk about vibrant expressions. That whole thing was an abstract. That bottom part with the cactus, that was just, that's the part I painted into it after the background had dried. All the way down to the yellow is poured? Yeah. And the yellow probably went all the way down to where the desert is, but I painted mm. over that because yeah. it just came out where, ooh, look, if I do this, it'll look like a sunset with the sun going down. And, you know. Interesting. So I wonder if when you let the background speak to you, it, it sounded a little frustrating to me to imagine having 20 different projects going at once. Oh, no. But I imagine if you are giving them, you're giving them time yeah, to speak to absolutely. you, that frees you up. And with that second collection, remember I said I'm working in three collections. The second collection, um, that one is so different than anything. Even the process is different. Um, because it's, it's kind of funny in that classical painting is typically you paint in very thin glazes mm -hmm. of oil and each glaze has to dry, and you can go back in and work into it, but that's how you get the depth. Um, like I said, Renaissance artists and all that, how there's a kind of warm glow that looks really deep, even though it's, 
That's because it's done in layers. And so this other style that I've developed over the, well, it's developed over the last 15 years, I've only been showing it for seven. Um, it's almost a joke on me in that it's very classical, but in a way exaggerated way. It's because I paint them with acrylic and automotive paint and all kinds of additives, but between each layer, I have a layer of a specific epoxy I have. And so I'm building layers like a classical painting, although they certainly don't look classical. They don't look classical. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to come back and look at the rest of the images that we have uh, after a short break. We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month, depends when we're busy, we get together less often, but we love to see you here to talk about the preeminent healthcare issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about healthcare, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. Hi, we're back. This is Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Series. We are coming to you live from Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu. I'm talking with artist Tom Mandro, and we're going to get right back to uh, your paintings. Let's take a look at the next one that we've got. I, I wish we could have the whole oh. gallery here. Oh, oh yeah, I don't, I don't even yeah. remember see, seeing now, anything now, like yeah, this. Yeah, no, see, that's a retired collection. Ah, that okay. was called the Fragile Universe Collection, where I just did a whole bunch of paintings of the universe and bubbles. And typically, what I would put in one of the bubbles is either an, an extinct animal or an animal that was on the endangered list. Um, you know, and it was I just a representative. Yeah, it, I'm that's a an, that was actually an extinct one. <laughs> but they did roam the world at one time. <laughs> but yeah, so, like so now that. you see the, the you know, other kinds of collections that are. It doesn't mean I won't ever do them again, it just means I'm not actively doing them because I'm. In some others, you, right just now. something yeah. else is blowing exactly. sunshine up your skirt. Yep, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> now, now there's a good vibrant expression. In fact, that's one of the very few pieces I actually have hanging at my house. Oh yeah. I don't hang my own artwork typically, um, because what's funny about me also as an artist is not many artists do this, but I actually collect artwork. I'm a really serious collector. I've been collecting for thirty some odd years, and so is my wife. And so we have other people's artwork in our house. Oh. But that is one of two pieces of mine that is always on display. And it's called Dragon Dance. I did a, um, a whole series of dancers um, because both of my kids were dancers. Oh. In fact, one of them still making her living as a dancer. And um, so, and that was one of my f more favorite pieces personally. So it never went to a gallery, never was for sale. Oh, okay, you kept that one. For but even the it. background, you can see the background of it is poured paint. So is this one that started with a background? Yeah, and the inspired yeah. That's you to That's a move vibrant it? expression. It's got almost a. It's got maybe that's what it is. It's got almost like a Leroy Neiman feel to it. Well, then probably you, the coloration of yeah. it, because if you really look at and Leroy, don't get me wrong, he is a. Um, Definitely an influence on me, as was Salvador Dali, Peter Max. There's a whole bunch that, I mean, Heronius Bosch was one of my heroes. I mean, there's, uh, I love art. I just do. Yeah. I, I, um, thank God for the invention of the camera. Because <laughs> up until the 1850s, the whole job of an artist, and this is, was their job, was to do portraits, to commemorate battles, um, cities, whatever, because there were no cameras. So artists were required to paint things realistically because yeah. there was no other way to reference them. Right. I think within three seconds after the camera was invented, Impressionism started. <laughs> Artists were finally free to do finally whatever they free. wanted to do. Yeah. They wanted, yeah. So creativity happened. Oh, that's an old one. This is Salvador Dali. Yeah, that's funny Definitely. too that you go to that one. Yeah. That was painted probably in 1972. That was before my first one man show. Now you've got a couple of patriotic, uh, a couple of pieces with flags well, in them. But that was in the cell. You got to remember, those are the old ones um, from 19. I graduated high school in 1969, which is right in the midst of the Vietnam War. Yeah, um, I went to college at the height of the Vietnam War, and I, I don't want to get into politics, but certain parts of my philosophy haven't changed even from them. The government may have changed, but what I think about them hasn't so much. <laughs> Well, and because we have cameras, you can express that <laughs> in your art. Let's see. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. I want to make sure that we get through all of them before we... Oh, oh. yeah. See, and these are the ones I picked yeah. offline that just 
That's totally fact, different. That, you know, it's funny, the, uh, the model for that, her name was Kalia. And the reason I picked her is because I had never seen such a cute unisex baby. It, she could be a girl or a boy. You can't, oh. you know, and she's mixed. And so everything about her was like this universal child. Oh. And it was called Kalia's World. And as you can see, it's far more realistic mm -hmm. than the work I do now. Yeah, and it looks like it could be a photograph yeah, within exactly. a painting. Yep. Okay, next one, please, Jerry. It's interesting seeing these since I didn't know what you had. Now, this is a collection that okay. I do maybe one a year of. It's a pretty much retired collection. And um, it's called the Rainbow Critters. And there's a whole series of them. But how it started, it wasn't even for artistic purposes to begin with. Um, I also used to and I have two, they're, well, they're still young daughters. They're 24 and 25. But when they were little kids, they were my art critics. I would show them everything I painted. And, you know, there was one time, and it was pretty funny because I'd bring home this one new nude or semi-nude painting. And my daughter, who was probably seven or eight at the time, she said, not another naked lady. <laughs> Can you paint something we would like? And so I came up literally with the rainbow critters, and they were painted for the kids only. They were never to be seen by the public. Cause, but it was also a pretty cool um, study in color for me, you know, in really bold, bright yeah. colors. And they actually got a life because um, of a gallery that wanted to do a specific show for me. So they flew out from New York to my Vegas studio, and they were looking at all my different work, because like I said, different kinds of stuff. And all of a sudden, they see these stacked up in a corner, and they start looking, and they go, what are these? I said, oh, they're, they're cartoons. They're kind of a joke. And they wound up having a show with those. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it wasn't by plan. But you know, it's funny, because they've, they've evolved into this rock and rainbow critters now, where they're all musicians and stuff. Oh. And so it's a whole different thing. <laughs> Interesting. Ah. So here's, OK, now this isn't a painting. No, it, this is a body cast. And you these, also do these? Yeah. These are body sculptures, or I get a model, and I put a whole mixture of this alginate and everything. In other words, I take an exact copy of their body. Okay. And what I do, then I sculpt them and cut them, and I get different, you know, different shapes to them, and I paint something on them. This one happened to be abstract, but I'll paint scenes on the bodies. And it's a whole, in fact, actually, I, I don't know if I should mention them or not, but one of my great mentors, and I've only had two or three in my career, um, it was the, I used to go to his studio in Colorado to learn from him, and he just passed away like two weeks ago. And at 68 years old, but oh. he was one of the best sculptors ever. His name was David Parvin. But, um, and he influenced you with that oh, absolutely. sort of work. I learned pretty much. I thought I knew how to do, how to do these things until I met David. Oh. Yeah. So you like to play with different, not only different mediums, yeah. but you mix different chemicals into your paints yep. and uh, um, epoxies yeah. you're using La, that, to get yeah. the I, um, one. Start doing, oh, yeah, that, now see that, that, that one there is, uh, you know, once again, that's the vibrant expressions. You can see the background, it's completely abstract, but you can, this is a good example, just like the um, dancer one was in that, it looks like I painted the the background to fit the horse because right. it really fits it the way it rotates around the horse. Yeah. But the background was there first, so in essence, I painted the horse to fit the background. Here now, here this is probably a really <laughs> this is coming from someone who I I paint just for my own entertainment. Yeah. I have no education That's whatsoever, fun. and I look at this and I so I'm an outsider artist. I'm so outside, but I look at that painting and I think, okay, so you're doing your background first, and then you're painting your horse. So if you mess up, then how are you going to recreate that the flow of that background? Oh, you don't. You can't. But artists never mess up. There's no such thing. Oh, I mess up. No, 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 no. <laughs> First thing you learn, if you, if you are in a college program and you're in the art department and your goal is a BFA, if you have any professors at all who are worth their salt, they will tell you that an artist can't mess up. You may not be um, creating what you thought you were going to do. You're just creating something different. <laughs> you did not make a mistake. Okay. They, said it's, they said it's one of the great advantages of this job is that you can't screw up. Okay. <laughs> that makes me want to go home and <laughs> paint some more. Awesome, you just inspired me. Do we we have some more? 
Let's see if we can. Uh, oh, see, there's a Vietnam War one. Yeah. In fact, that, I know that um, my social media director posted that yesterday for Veterans Day. Oh. Uh. And once again, it's kind of a it's a comment because you can put it together. But the title of that one was "Old Soldiers Never Die." Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. That. Exactly. Gotta be, yeah. There's a lot to the naming of them. Oh, uh, I, I, well. I don't always spend a lot of time on names, but I do sometimes. You know, there's sometimes where the name is as critical as the piece well, itself. Well, that name added a yeah, whole new well, that, layer. That one, yeah, that one, the title pretty much sets it all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. We've got three minutes. I'm sorry. You were, you're going to oh. have to come back. The, that, this one was kind of a cleansing thing. It was, it was called Puzzle. As, as you can tell by most of my paintings, I'm certainly not afraid of color, but every now and again, you do a black and I do white. a black and white. And this, I think it has, I can't remember now because it's been so long since I've tried to find them all. I think it has like maybe 13 different zebra faces in it, but they're all linked together and twisted around. And you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's called puzzle because it is a puzzle. That's one of those. Well, there's a piece of yours that I couldn't find online, the piano. That's the one oh, you, yeah, you yeah, caught yeah. me looking at yeah. in your studio. I was just drooling over it. Um, there are certain paintings that immediately when I see them, I just want to sit down and stare. I just want to sit down and stare. That's the, that's the whole joy of art for the viewer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's why, at least in my uh, opinion, there's so much diversity in art because we're all so different as to what touches us. I've had people in the past, I'll walk up to, I'll see a woman looking at one of my pieces, and I'll go up to talk to her to see what she, and she'll be, tears will be streaming. Mm -hmm. Typically, I'll turn around and leave because I don't even want to know. <laughs> but, you know, there's some people who get really excited about a big white canvas with a little red dot in the middle. And it really does trip their trigger. I mean, yeah. that's what they love. And then there's the others who like the complete opposite, where it looks like a photograph. And so each one of us, looks at pieces and they may not you might walk through a museum walk through a museum and you know you're just kind of glad and then all of a sudden boom yeah you get hit by the thunder something bolt. makes you stop see you know that that was that was one of the um rainbow critters you notice oh, okay. it's real broad color strong yeah. yeah let's go to the next one there's one turtle in here i really want to get to oh okay that's, that's one of the girls what sculptures the, but as you can see i paint on the sculpture and that's the las vegas sign ah, on okay. a body very cool so that's a, that's a woman. The, the last one is the one I, yeah. the most, oh, no, I thought I got one of your, uh, let me see real quickly that you do, you have the Illuminati in the dark, yeah, the, Illuminari. the Illuminati collection, which is, that's one that's done in layers, and I m actually mix my own pigments using strontium-based powder that um, I, I get, the stuff I use now I get in China because I don't know what they do different. But because anybody can buy glow in the dark paints, what I do, I mix my own and I use my own chemicals and everything else. But what it is is I have you have the painting one way in the light, mm -hmm. but the strontium absorbs light all day, and when you turn off the lights, it glows. It's, and it's a different oh, and it's painting. A com yeah, it's and the same subject. Same subject. Although I've done some now, see, that's the like I said, they always advance. I did a commission of a mermaid. But when the lights go off, the mermaid disappears and it's all turtles. Oh, yeah, so nice. I'm, doing, I'm doing some different stuff like I, that. I, I'm so sorry that, that we have to wrap up. Oh, I do want to say really quickly that your work is hanging in the homes of um, oh. President George Bush, yeah. um, both of George Bush's, yes. Cher, Martin mm -hmm. Scorsese, uh, Robert De Niro, Francis Ford Coppola, Al Pacino, oh, Joe Pesci, and some others, yeah. But you know, the, my re regular hard-working people who buy my pieces are also. just as important, and there's a whole lot more of those than there are These name brands. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and tell me, there was one website you sent me to, a .co yeah, website. Yeah, it's madro, M-A-D-R-O dot co. Because I've got different websites for different things. And so instead of listing them all, I just have kind of a links website, which is madro.co, not com, dot dot co. Madro.co. And so if you go there, you can find a lot of, you find links to a lot of Tom's work. And he has two galleries in Haleiwa, very mm -hmm. easy for us to run up there. And they're really something. You can see those, the paintings that glow in the dark. Um, and we have to wrap up. Okay.
Thank you very much for being oh, here. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you to, um, who do I need to thank? Zuri Bender, who is in my ear. Uh, Sachi Slomov, who is our, uh, helps out with communications and is our stage manager. Chrissy Goffigan, our uh, communications manager. And Jay Fidel, who somehow manages to put it all together. If you would like to come down and visit me, talk with me in the studio, please do let me know. You can email me at kumukuhuadirector at gmail.com, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you.